Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to Testimonial in Storytelling, Canadian Extractivism in Territories Affected by Genocide. My name is Gabriela Jimenez and I am with Kairos Canada. Uh, please be advised that simultaneous interpretation is available in English and Spanish. On the lower uh, Zoom bar, you will find a globe icon. If you're on a mobile phone or other device, the interpretation feature is found by clicking the three dots. Click on the interpretation icon and select your language of preference, English or Spanish. If you speak English and Spanish, you can leave the interpretation feature off. Thank you to Paulina Baez, the interpreter. In addition, please make sure your mic is off and be conscious of the status of your camera. Buenas tardes. Me llamo Gabriela Jiménez y soy parte de Kairos Canada. Bienvenidos a Testimonios y Cuentos Extractivismo Canadiense. Good evening. My name is Gabriela Jiménez. I'm with Kairos and welcome to Testimonio and Storytelling, Canadian Extractivism in Territories Affected by Genocide. Today we will have access to the interpretation function. So you will see that globe icon on the bottom part of your screen, or if you're on your phone, you'll find the three dots on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Click on interpretation and select your preferred language, either English or Spanish. If you speak English and Spanish, you don't need to activate the interpretation function. And thank you to Paulina Baez, our interpreter for today. Please also make sure to keep your microphone muted and be mindful of your camera. We are meeting today on the traditional territories of the indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. I acknowledge the original caretakers of this land on which I stand, the Huron Wendat, Seneca, and Mississaugas of the Credit. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet. We acknowledge the land. Our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree, the Miti, the Dene, the Soto and Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, uh, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Unu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to come. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of the stand to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. I acknowledge the land of the Huron Wendat, Seneca, and Mississaugas of the Credit indigenous peoples where I am now. And I would like to thank my colleague, Connor Sarasen, who wrote this territorial acknowledgement for Kairos Canada. Across Turtle Island, the breadth and scale of Canadian extractivism is unmistakable. And also indisputable is the strength of indigenous land and water protection in response to the often violent ramifications and impulses behind the large scale, behind large scale resource extraction. Today, we are here to commemorate two recent publications that highlight this friction and that honor the place of testimony and storytelling to indigenous cosmovisions which ground indigenous land defense. The two publications are the book, Testimonio, Canadian Mining in the Aftermath of Genocides in Guatemala, edited by Catherine Nolan and Graham Russell, and the report, Pulastiquik and Mi'kmaq Grandmothers, Land Water Defenders, Sharing and Learning Circle, Generating Knowledge for Action, written by Sherry Pictou, with Janet Conway and Angela Day. The, testimonies in the, the testimonials in the book and the stories in the grandmother's report serve as constellations that at once memorialize and guide indigenous approaches to land and water defense. Today, you will hear from four speakers who will each answer one set of questions. The moderator will then provide a reflection and we will close with a quick round of responses and conclusions from our four speakers. I thank you all for being here with us. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the events co-organizer, the Atlantic Regional Solidarity Network, as well as the events co-sponsors, the Global Social Justice Project at Cape Breton University, New Brunswick Media Co-op, Solidarité Fredericton, Atlantic Human Rights Center, Mining Watch Canada, the Department of Human Rights at St. Thomas University, 
and Maritimes Guatemala Breaking the Silence Solidarity Network. We are honored to have Joan Baxter moderate today's event. Uh, Joan Baxter is an award-winning author and journalist who for three decades lived in and reported from seven uh, African countries for several international media outlets. Her research focuses on social and, uh, social and environmental justice and the ravages of neoliberalism, extractive industries, and neocolonialism. Welcome, Joan. Joan, you are muted. Sorry, Luddite, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriela. Um, thank you, everybody who's tuned in from wherever you are today. Um, and it's a great honor to be with you. And I also thank all the participants this evening, the organizers and the people who are sponsored this really important event. Um, an hour is hardly going to be enough time to do justice to the storytelling and the histories contained in these two incredibly powerful books. Um, both of them can be very painful to read, but both of them can be also very inspiring. The stories they tell of indigenous communities standing their ground in spite of incredible hardship and atrocities committed against them by extractive industries and their accomplices in, in state truck structures are, are stories that everybody needs to read, especially here in Canada. Um, the testimonies, the, they're firsthand, they're powerful and they're often painful, but they're also mixed with stories of small victories and the perseverance and the determination of the people involved and the collaboration among Indigenous communities with solidarity organizers, academics, and journalists is really and truly inspiring. Um, and in the case of Alton Gas, I hope we have a moment to talk about that tonight. In Mi'kma'ki, there's also a small victory, I think, that deserves to be celebrated. Um, the stories in these works help channel despair and outrage that they can inspire or that the reader may feel as they go through them, um, they can channel those stories into some kind of constructive energy because you can see what other people are doing as they do fight these injustices and convert really negative emotions into very positive actions. Um, I thank you, Jackie, and everyone involved in this event for the invitation. And I thank everyone who contributed to these works. Um, I'm really humbled. It's really humbling to read some of the accounts um, of what people have gone through. And this event is unfortunately a very timely. I hear that even as we're meeting right now, there's tension and violence near the former Canadian owned Sky Resources and then Hud Bay Minerals nickel mine in the community of El Estor in Guatemala. And that the current Swiss owners of that mining company, I do love how they like to just pass off like hot potatoes, their, their awful assets, that the Swiss owners are refusing to comply with orders from the country's highest court to stop operations. And instead there's a campaign of terror being waged yet again. As so painfully and starkly documented in testimonio, this is the community where Adolfo Ish was murdered in the mine secure, by the mine security in 2009 and where 11 women were gang raped among other atrocities documented, documented in the book, some of which we'll hear about this evening. I really look forward to hearing from all of the people who are participating this evening, who can tell us much, much more about this, about the harm that extractivism inflicts on indigenous people and lands, and also look very carefully at Canada's egregious role and complicity in these atrocities. As I said, an hour is a very short time to do justice to the enormity of the issues on the agenda this evening. So I won't take any more of your precious, precious time. Let's get started. Um, I'd like to begin, if I may, with a question to Isabel Solis. Isabel Solis is a Maya Kiche lawyer and human rights defender, genocide survivor who's accompanied mining struggles throughout Guatemala. And Isabel, I would like to ask you a little bit about the central themes in the book Testimonio, which are genocide and land. Can you talk a bit about your relationship to land from your experience as a K'iche woman for us? How does genocide and Canadian mining in Guatemala intersect with this experience? And how is the current situation in El Estor epitomized this?
Bueno, no entendí si empiezo a hablar. I wasn't sure if I should start responding to the question. Sí, por favor. Gracias, perdón. Okay, eh, thank you. Bueno, buenas tardes a cada una de las personas que nos escuchan. Good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's here with us today. Thank you for this opportunity to be here with you. Pues me hacen, especialmente con, con esta, eh, este libro que ustedes entiendo Thank que you han... for sending me the questions in advance. I think this is a very interesting book. This is a book best, based on testimonies. Personas, comunidades, familias, o pueblos. I think a lot of people, communities, families, even countries can understand this system that we're experiencing. It's a system of death and it's a lot of Canadian companies are behind that here in Guatemala. The question I've been asked is, what is my experience? What is my relationship with the land? Maybe for those who haven't lived or grown up in an indigenous community, it might be difficult for them to understand us. And it might be difficult for us to explain in a language that isn't our own, what we know, what we've experienced or what our relationship with the land truly is. But I'll try to explain, and I hope I can convey the main idea. And if you have any questions, please let me know. When we're born, the land is our being, and we are part of that land. We feel protected by the land. Que también la tierra es medicina. And that's why we're taught that land is also medicine. And we even love the smell of the earth because it's our mother. My community, for example, is an agricultural community. We have fruits that we harvest. We also have all sorts of different livestock. And that's the context where I grew up in. That's how my relationship with nature began. Since I was very young, I learned how to take care of different animals and plants. And those are also things that help to feed us and nourish us. Since I was young, I learned about respect for land and for animals. We coexist with land and animals. And without them, we wouldn't be able to live. When we're born in the mountains, and I imagine maybe other people who are here today too can relate to this. Sometimes we play, we play in the mountains. And it might happen that we fall and we get hurt, but the earth is what heals us. It's our medicine. And so we might grab a bit of dirt, put that on our wound and, and that'll help us to heal. And that's what we learned since we're young. We have a relationship with the land, with the earth, with the moon, and with the sun. And in my case, I've had a relationship with the moon and what it represents in each stage of our life. For me, for example, something that I learned a lot about was the relationship of the moon when you want to cut your hair. If you want to have long hair or short hair, there are certain times when it's better or not to cut your hair. That's between one year to 10 years when I learned about that, when I gained that knowledge. 
in the community. But then the war came and it interrupted all of that. Everything I was learning at the heart of my family and the community, all of that took place between one and 10 years old. But then the war came and it destroyed our family. Part of our family was disappeared. We had to survive in different parts of the country. In this etapa, comprendí entonces. Eh, la lucha de los pueblos. And during that time, I learned about the struggles, the communities, and I learned about what different communities were experiencing and facing. And it was thanks to everything I learned with my family and with my community when I was younger that, younger that I had a strong relationship with the land. And then when war came is when I learned about death at that time, I learned about rep repression, violence, disappearance of a lot of people, young people, children, women. That's an experience that I've carried throughout my life. And I identified with land defenders because the land and earth is part of our life. And so defending land is defending our own life. I don't want to go on too long, so I'll go to the second point about genocide and Canadian mining companies. The case that I know most closely that I'm most familiar with is the nickel mine, which is located in El Estor. And this company has been present in the country for a long time. And we're very familiar with their trajectory of repression, violence, threat, and death. I think the most recent one is is an example of how the Kikchi community, what they have experienced since 1960. But I'd like to emphasize that when this mining company came back and or started up again in 2005, 2006, the mining activity started up again. Most mining companies now have a discourse or a narrative that might sound very interesting or appealing, but what they do in practice is very different. The Canadian mining company, because this is a Canadian mining company, which restarted its operations in 2005 in Ellistore with repressive practices that have to do with genocide side because they displace communities in order to expand their operations. And the displacement is also connected to the destruction of several mountains in El Estor. If you've been able to see it, see it, you'll see that these are completely ravaged mountains that are now desolate. It's important to point this out because some people, even though we're well aware about the history of this Canadian mining company, some people still ask us, why don't we recognize the employment that the mining company generates? But in the case of El Astor, the supposed development and the employment, we don't see that anywhere. That hasn't actually come to pass. The development of the Kikchi community has experienced since the mining company arrived. These are numbers from the National Institute of Statistics that I can share with you. For example, in 2002, before the mining operations started again, poverty in the Kikchi community in El Stor was 68.5%. 
So it's a poverty rate of 68.5%. That's in 2002. In 2011, the mining company had restarted its operations and the poverty rate increased to 82.4%. And in 2018, the National Statistics Institution says that poverty increased even more to 89%. So that's the development, in quotation marks, that this company has brought to us. It has increased and worth the rate of poverty in LS store. And these are statistics that the state has published. These aren't imagined statistics there's there are also statistics of people who have been murdered and of women who have been raped there's currently a case in canada against this mining company because it has threatened women and young people's lives So what I've shared with you just now in summary is what I experienced from until I was 10 years old and then how that was transformed when I had to defend my life when it was threatened by those mining companies that supposedly offer development, but what they've really brought is death, permanent and systematic death. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Isabel. That was um, powerful, uh, devastating, um, and very meaningful. Really helpful to help, especially for people in Canada to get a feel for what this actually really means on the ground in your homeland and on your land. Um, we're going to turn now to Aniceto Lope, um, who is a Maya Mam community organizer from San Miguel. Uh, San Miguel Ixtahuacan, I hope I have said that correctly, uh, in Guatemala. He's, Aniceto is part of a group that petitioned the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to stop operations at the Marlin Mine and urged Canadian churches and pension holders to divest from Gold Corps. Aniceto's testimony appears in the book, and it's very powerful. And my question to you, Aniceto, is... Uh, it's about, well, it's a big question. I'll just start by mentioning that Maya Mam woman Diadora Hernandez uh, in strong opposition to Canadian gold mining is on the cover of the book. Uh, Diadora survived being shot in the head by men believed to be connected to the Marlin Mine, a project of Canada's Gold Corps Inc. Can you talk about the early years of the Marlin Mine project in San Miguel, Vista? Ishtawakan and what its imposition in Mam and Sipaka Pense territories looked like, and what were some of the ways that your communities responded to all of this? The floor is yours. Hola. Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. Can you hear me? Sí, lo escuchamos. Yes, we can hear you. Bien, muchas gracias. Eh, me da mucho gusto saludarlas eh, con un fuerte abrazo. Thank you. Lucha. It's a pleasure for me to be here and I'm sending you affectionate greetings from our indigenous communities. My name is Aniceto Lopez Diaz. Um, I am a Maya Mam indigenous person from the San Miguel Ixtahuacan San Marcos community. And the Marlin Mine has been here for a long time. And it, it, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. Básicamente es un testimonio debido que creo que 10 minutos me... No, I have 10 minutes. I connected a bit late. I, my apologies for being late. But I can tell you, I can tell you the story about San Miguel. Yes, 
Sí, por favor, continúe con su, re, su relato. Yes, please eh, continue. Eh, bueno, Thank you. es una oportunidad para mí comentarles que en el territorio nuestro de San Miguel Ixtahuacán, pues, in our community in San Miguel Ixtahuacán in 1996, some people arrived. They were supposedly to going to survey the territory. And the goal was to carry out a, a, de a development project in quotations. And because our community is an impoverished community, it's a community that has a lot of needs and needs support. A lot of the people here thought that it truly was going to be a development project for families here. And our community members were manipulated by municipal authorities in the time. El proceso de ingreso de la mina. And that's when the mining started coming into our territory. In the end, we realized that it was a gold and silver mine in our municipality. And it's a shame to share this story. And I know that our sisters and brother in El Estor have suffered a lot, just like us. When the mine started, we've seen that whole process. And when I see that, I feel very sad because I know they're experiencing exactly what we experienced. When people in our community realized they had been manipulated, they learned that there was gold in our territory. They didn't know that. And, and the 2,000 quetzals, 3,000 quetzales had been paid. That's around $400. That was 21 by 21 square meters. And then they realized that they had been misled and that gold and silver were going to be extracted from their land. Then people started complaining about the price they'd been paid for their land. The family started to come together and they started to put a case together but in the end, in the end, they weren't able to receive a fair price for their land. There was one person who had land within the mining location who received 30,000 quetzales. And so that generated even more anger amongst the families. And then a collective op opposition began on behalf of the community. And that was in 2002, 2003. And then the mine continued operating, continued expanding. And then we started to see harms and negative effects. There were people who were injured in the mine and nothing was done for them. It, the mine promised to give them money, but it was only to silence them and not to help them. These were fa families or neighbors that had been employed by the mine. And then people realized that the the residences within the mine where the employees stayed were starting to crumble, were starting to fall apart. And also that the sources of water where people went to get water for their families and their homes and their animals were also being affected. So that's when the community started to organize even more. 
We had support from the Catholic Church. We came together and we created the Defense Front in order to support the families. The families were under a lot of threat. They were receiving so many threats during the case. And Leodora Hernandez, who is such as a brave woman, she didn't want to sell her land. She denied and was against selling her land. And then unknown men arrived at her home and tried to murder her. They tried to kill her. The bullet just went through her eye. That's why now she only has one eye left. One of the examples, but there's several examples, a group of women who also resisted, who were against the mine. They were reported, the police came. They wanted to arrest them and take them to jail. The police was going to arrest them and take them to jail, but they were able to get out because we all helped each other and we supported each other to make sure that they weren't captured. A lot of us received death threats because we protested. It was February 11th. That was year 2011, I think. We protested And when we were harassed by mine employees and sicarios and we received death threats, a lot of us received death threats. And, and the goal was to silence us. What they wanted was to kill us, to kill us so that we wouldn't protest again. The mine strategy has always been and continues to be, and I'm sure people in El Story experience the same thing. This mind strategy is, is to confront us to, or in other words, the mind tries to make us feel that those who defend life, those who defend land, territory, nature, the mind makes it seem as we are enemies of development, that we don't want development, that we're against employment that we're against those who are working in the mine. So our very own people are turned against us. And that creates a conflict. And then there's war. There's war amongst us. But the mine is the one who's responsible for that, along with the authorities, because sadly in, in Guatemala, the authorities are completely manipulated by extractive industries. They use the military police forces in order to intimidate people. And more sadly still to give safety and security to the company, which should be public safety becomes safety and security for the mining company. That, that is very sad. That's what happened to us. We were reported. There were charges against us and we had to get rid of those charges through the help of lawyers. And a lot of people just didn't, couldn't, stand, couldn't stand the threats anymore. And so they fled the country. I know six people, six people who had to flee the country because since 2011, in February, when we received death threats, they fled the country, they left their family. And I know some of them have, have made it to the United States, others have stayed in Mexico, and, and it's a shame. It's really sad. And I share this with you because the consequences of these conflicts are immigration, people flee due to the conflict, and war, war within our own communities and the government. I know that the country isn't gaining much from this, that not the, the benefits don't remain in the country and that it's not worth it for all the harm created by the mining company. And there are many people that still live in those unsafe homes, those homes that are crumbling. 
and there's still a conf conflict, there's still a war amongst families. And there's, there's no harmony between us. There are confrontations. Those of us who have opposed the, the mine have been tagged as enemies of development. And we're, however, we're at peace with the earth because earth gives us water, food, and air, and there's a future for coming generations. But when we see all of that being threatened, then we have to oppose it. We have to defend. There were legal charges against us, and so we had to recur to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in Washington. We reported these cases. There were certain measures that were afforded to our community, but in the end, that didn't move forward. We didn't see progress because we didn't have enough support. We weren't able to support our case or document our case. We didn't have the financial means to do that, but we were. We were able to go all the way to Washington, to, to the American Commission. Some of those measures were met. For example, some of the families have access to drinking water, and so the government had to ensure that these families had access to drinking water. That's the only thing we've seen. But in terms of the homes, the environmental damage, earth and the soil have been harmed. Anyway, it has been a very difficult story. It's a social conflict that has led to division. And the most sad thing of all is that these companies continue causing harm. They continue hurting our people in Guatemala. And that saddens me so much. When I tell the story, it, it makes me angry. It also makes me sad. And what's going to happen? What's going to happen with so many families who are being harassed, threatened, raped, We've always said we are not in support of those projects. We love our lives. We love our natural surroundings and harmony and balance in nature. But those extractive projects are very harmful for us. That's what I can share with you today. If there are any questions, please let me know and I would be happy to answer them. Thank you again. Thank you so much for this time and this opportunity. Thank you to the organizers of the event, Jackie, Graham, Stephen, and other people. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you. You encourage us, you inspire us, and we will continue fighting. Thank you. Thank you, Aniceto. I think if anybody should be inspired and encouraged, I think it's us here in Canada to, to take up the battle and do what we can also at this end. I really thank you for your powerful, um, devastating testimony and also for your courage and the organization that you and your community have. have, have your pers perseverance is incredible. So we'll move now. Um, to a new continent, I guess we'll move north, same continent, um, but we're moving over to Sherry Picto. Um, and Sherry Picto, PhD, is a Mi'kmaq woman from Esiktuk, and she's an assistant professor of law and management, Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Governance, tier two at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And Professor Picto is the lead author of Wolostokiok and Mi'kmaq Grandmothers Land Water Defenders Sharing and Learning Circle, Generating Knowledge for Action. And it was an amazing report. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, I guess, um, boy, it's, it's, a, it's a leap. We're moving from Guatemala to Nova Scotia, but it's not such a leap after all. Um, We've been talking this evening about relationships to land, genocide, and mining in Indigenous territories in Guatemala. And as a Mi'kmaq woman um, working with the Indigenous grandmothers throughout the Wabanaki Confederacy, can you share some of your experience 
and the importance of storytelling in this area. What role do women play in safeguarding indigenous land sovereignty in the face of extractivism in their territories? And how does the Alton gas struggle exemplify this? And if you have a little bit of good news on that one, please share it with us. It's all yours, Sherry. Okay. Well, Alio, thank you. And uh, greetings uh, here. And what we call Canada, we call Northern Turtle Island. Um, yeah, it's such an honor to be here. And I want to really thank the organizers and thank my uh, sister and my mom and brother. Uh, some of this uh, testimony is really difficult to hear, but we need to hear it. And um, I'm going to, you, you know, how I become involved with um, these uh, two groups of women, uh, one with the um, struggling against the Sisson mine in New Brunswick and the other with the Alton gas project where they're going to dig out these large natural salt caverns and put the salt in the river and um, fill the, the um, caverns with uh, natural gas. Um, I noticed that they had no voice anywhere. And so the question comes, well, why are they doing this? Why are they trying to block this development? Why are they doing this? And, um, and, so, and they, so my concern was about creating space. And I wanna come back to that if I have time about creating the space for them to tell their stories. And it was just really ex an extraordinary experience. And just before the pandemic, we managed to get these two groups of women together to share their stories. And I, what the indigenous women, the grandmothers, um, and I must say two-spirited or uh, uh, gender diverse people as well, what they exposed was so very important because here in Canada, there seems to be this perception that we have all these indigenous rights and it looks good on paper. Sometimes we win in court, but how those rights are interpreted and implemented, implemented is another story. And one of the legal duties here in Canada is supposed to consult with indigenous people before development can take place on their lands. However, what these women have exposed is just how difficult and limited that consultation process is. Number one, the consultation is limited to um, leadership. It's not to the broader grassroots people. And number two, there seems to be, or those, those negotiations or that, those consultations are very corporate driven, very neoliberal corporatism and that seems to be the only mechanism that the government is offering us to exercise our indigenous rights and so the the indigenous women uh the Mi'kmaq women and the Wallistic women they expose the, these uh processes they also to they also um expose the weaknesses of environmental assessments and they don't go far enough. They also um, expose just how the law can be weaponized against indigenous women in very violent ways. And this would be through injunctions. There was a study put out that um, like the majority of injunctions that corporate sector asks against indigenous people defending their lands are granted. Whereas over 80% of those injunctions that First Nations people ask are denied. And also those stories expose violence against non, uh, by non-Indigenous men who have been um, promised jobs. And also just as my Mayan brother was explaining, this conflict, this divide and conquer conflict that is created within uh, communities. And this, is, this, this happens. And in the case of the Alton gas, what happened was there was incidents where um, the company would hire indigenous or Mi'kmaq men as their part of their security. And so the women were going up against their own people in some cases. And so <laughs> the importance of all of this, uh, while those struggles were very real, 
And the good news that my good friend uh, has pointed out is that the Alton gas had pulled out, but I want to come back to that. Um, but what was also ex 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 exposed was a resurgence of our ceremonies, a resurgence of the water ceremony, a resurgence of the moon ceremony, a resurgence of um, women's ceremonies. And all of that land defense was done in ceremony and prayer. And we tend to take that for granted. And in the report, there's extraordinary uh, stories. And yes, Alton Gas has pulled out and this is a major celebration after years of struggling. However, it, um, uh, with our sisters in New Brunswick against a sis and mine, we were hoping the deadline of December 2020 would pass, but that company went in last minute, Northcliff, out in Vancouver, British Columbia, that's in partnership with, um, oh, what is the name of that? Todd Corporation in New Zealand. They applied for a two-year extension. So that has us a little bit nervous. And of course, here in Canada, it's a big country. We know on the West Coast, there's still the struggle against the... Uh, pipelines there and I guess what is a, the, the, to, to demonstrate just how Canada uh, though it may appear to be nice in some incidences how stringent they are or how driven they are the government is with the um, corporations particularly in oil and gas I read this uh, article where they're projecting oil and gas will last until 2060 or the other thing that's where this crosses the borders between the North and South that us indigenous people in um, Northern Turtle Island have to pay attention to is that the government will withdraw, like for example, they withdrew from the NAFTA agreement, the Northern Free Trade Agreement because they said it was undemocratic. And yet they keep in these, um, these arbitration rules, international arbitration rules, where they themselves, Canada, will sue poor countries like Venezuela for billions of dollars if they don't hold up to their end of the bargain or they try to demonstrate their own sovereignty and, ind and independence. So that is a little bit worrisome. But the good news is, and I just wanted to, I, I, I started reading this uh, this really important book and really want to thank uh, um, um, in between the lines and um, how important this work is and to providing the space for this testimony because in indigenous country or indigenous thought um, there's this methodology coming to surface now um, and it's always been there with our oral stories, with our songs, with our dance and so forth, that this is testimony. This is witnessing and the importance of witnessing and how we have a duty to witness. And there's something to be said uh, about mainstream media and the way that they focus on these events and do not expose the truth. And these, this book was just so uh, heart-wrenching, but very important because I think it's very important to have those testimonies, to have that witnessing. Uh, and we have to um, bring these people to light as I try to do with the uh, Willistic and uh, Mi'kmaq grandmothers, land defenders here on the Atlantic coast. And, um, well, Margaret Crest, everyone, what is the title, please? Testimonial Canadian Mining in the Aftermath of the Genocides in Guatemala. And I do know there's some ongoing court cases, and I do know for that it's going to be very interesting in British Columbia. There's been a First Nation that's also just launched uh, a court case against uh, a mining company. This is going to be interesting because we're quite aware of the, and, and we have to expose more Canadians to this, of what's happening, uh, what Canadian mining companies are doing around the world. And this always leads to question, if they're going to go to that extent to violate fundamental basic human rights, to violate the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and all those other international law, legal documents and legal um, 
um, declarations and, and, and so forth, then uh, I have to wrap up here. And then uh, what does this mean for us in Canada? And so I think, it's really, I think it's really super important. And I think the role of women um, that has been so erased or who are always under constant threatened as being disposable, as indigenous people in general disposable, that we're not so disposable. These are our stories. These are our, this is our testimony. And we as the broader public have a duty to witness that. Missid Nogama, all my relations, thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. That was really powerful. And it just brought home to me how actually there's no difference between the continents at all. Um, whether we're talking about Turtle Island here or Guatemala, the indigenous feelings for land obviously are, are very similar um, in, in both places, as are the atrocities committed by some of the mining and extractive companies. So moving right along, I don't want to keep everybody too long. Um, we'll move to our final participant this evening, and that's Catherine Nolan, who is a co-editor of the book Testimonial. And Catherine is a PhD professor of geography at the University of Northern British Columbia. And as I say, she's one of the editors of Testimonial. And I have a long question for you, Catherine. It looks quite complicated. Um, Testimonio talks about standing in solidarity and bearing witness rather than extracting knowledge as a radical art. As co-editor, you made a decision to focus on the testimonies of the people and communities directly impacted by Canadian mining in genocidal Guatemala and weave that with calls to action um, of Canadian economic investment and political support. As an academic and an activist, what is one of your major learnings from the process of editing testimonial and accompanying communities affected by Canadian mining in Guatemala? And what should Canadians do after reading this book? So over to you. There's, there's a set of questions. Thank, thank you, Joan. Thank you to all the organizers and uh, my fellow panelists. I'm so uh, I'm quite emotional listening here to uh, to your voices as I haven't been able to be in Guatemala since uh, March of 2020. And so I, I'm grateful to see and, and hear you and, and thank uh, Sherry for your contribution as well. And I see so many familiar names uh, and some faces uh, joining us on this call and uh, I'm thankful that you're all here. And um, so I'm actually coming to you from uh, uh, my parents' home. I'm visiting my family for one of the first times in a very long time. So I'm outside of Edmonton uh, from Treaty 6 territory within the Métis homelands. I'm uh, usually in Northern British Columbia on the unceded territory of the Clay Lake Tenay. Uh, but I'm here closer to my family and the Métis homelands where my family connections are in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, and I also want to, you know, share my respect for the Maya and Shinka people and territories uh, where we work. I really do think it's important to make these acknowledgements um, because we are working in solidarity and have tried to over uh, these, you know, 16, 17, 20 some years. Uh, working with people uh, who are land and water and community defenders and who have been as uh, our book documents and as Isabel and, uh, and Aniseto shared with us, people have been criminalized, you know, attacked, imprisoned, uh, tortured, raped, murdered uh, for their resistance to this imposed so-called development. Uh, where violence is used uh, to implement these kinds of, of projects. And so we've tried to work in solidarity and understand that um, solidarity is more than offering um, assistance and walking with people in their own struggle. We've, I think, come to learn, Graham Russell, who's my co-editor and I, and, and many of the people who are included as contributors in the book, see ourselves as working in solidarity understanding that uh, we're talking about Canadian issues as well as Guatemalan issues, that, that these are our issues that we need to, to work on here. 
And so I'll, I'll circle back to maybe at the end of my comments of the book is, is uh, you know, is really a call to Canadians to understand our, our role and the ways in which we can hopefully work to, to change these conditions. Um, so uh, it's a big question about my, my major learnings and, and this call to action. Uh, and and I, I will come to that. I, I think um, I'll make just a few comments that tie into what Aniceto and, and Isabel mentioned, as well as Sherry, really, um, about making sure that we're tying together these conversations of contemporary mining uh, with, as Isabel called it, right, a system of death, that um, we're talking about mining in the aftermath of genocides, where state orchestrated structural violence has taken on many forms over time. And we, we and others, um, Giovanni Batz has a new book coming out as well, focusing on this, uh, calling it the fourth invasion, you know, another way in which uh, the Mayan Shinka people have have grappled with, you know, the original Spanish invasion and then the invasion of international capital, which transformed land into property, land into property for export crops of, you know, coffee and cotton and bananas and so on. And then the, the uh, genocides of the 1980s and uh, 1970s and, and 80s. Uh, that this then was a time when mining laws were changed and Canadian uh, companies were involved in the changing of the laws to kind of cash in on this chaos that was created um, uh, with something we call in Canada or the, the government of Canada calls an extractives approach to development. And uh, through, through this book, I think with the many contributions for artists and activists and people on the ground and journalists and lawyers and community members and so on, we see that you know, this began, uh, it's tied, it has a long history, but we can see this moment when the conflict sort of officially ended with the peace accords and the granting of mineral and property rights without consultation with or consent of the affected communities. That's the foundational violation uh, of this moment that we're talking about that continues on. So I think the book focuses on, on many things, but this approach to land and life, that's you know the contested approach to land and life that's central to these mining projects where mining companies, I would say, are guided by global and national policies and, and profit-seeking interests, but the strongest impacts are felt in local communities and in families uh, and in individual bodies. And so we've tried with the book to focus on what we're calling predatory mineral exploitation um, and the accompanying chaos that it creates and exploits through these four sort of illustrative cases of four main mining struggles and the lived realities by the people most affected uh, by this. And so I, I would say that um, the underlying problem, of course, if we're, if we're gonna bring it back to Canada, uh, the underlying problem of all these cases is that the Canadian government and Canadian companies are choosing to do business in a racist, exploitative, repressive uh, conditions of Guatemala where impunity and corruption and you know, a fundamental lack of democracy are the norm. And our government you know, would call the Guatemalan government, Honduran government and so on, our democratic allies and have um, certainly not called out what is happening, but act the opposite, they have supported it almost at all costs. And so these are very Canadian problems that we're identifying here with, that play out on the ground uh, where others are experiencing the violent end of all this. But we are all experiencing the, the violence in, of course, different ways. But um, you know, tying in what, what Sherry has shared with us, this is not just a Guatemalan issue, that this is through the Americas that Canadian mining companies are you know, three quarters or so of the mining companies operating in Latin America are, are you know, Canadian based or, or home based in Canada. So these are very Canadian issues where decisions are made in the boardrooms and government offices in you know, Toronto, Vancouver uh, and Ottawa. 
Um, and so these problems that we see time and again are, are I, I would say they're logical and predictable given the conditions that are allowed to, to flourish where uh, companies are told to voluntarily comply with human rights norms and laws rather than having mandatory compliance, of course. And so, um, so that's part of the call, of course, that, that we can get into of, of what we uh, hope people will uh, continue to do, as many people on this call are doing it already. So, you know, getting the word out and sharing it with others. Uh, I think a major learning uh, and part of the question you asked me was about testimonial and, and and not only is that the title of the book, but that's kind of the core of how we approach this work. So Graham Russell and I have worked together for almost 20 years. He more in sort of direct community to support through rights action and uh, my side more through the university. And uh, But we've come together to run uh, delegations for, for many, many years together, trying to highlight these issues for um, university students and so on. Um, and so by valuing testimonial, it's something I had written about when I was a graduate student, like 20 some years ago. And, you know, coming back to it again, I think was really important to say testimonial is a, is a tool really for individual and community recollection of traumatic events, where we as researchers or, you know, community support folks and so on, that we are there to position ourselves doing this in solidarity and listen more than speak um, be really good listeners and witness and something i've come to embrace and i think it was at the heart of of um, how we approach this work was something that we've um, uh, come to see as insurgent research that we um, we learned from Adam Gowdry at the University of Alberta, right, which it's research and, and uh, direct community support that explicitly employs Indigenous worldviews that orients the knowledge creation that we're working towards, like pulling this book together, right, that it's uh, that knowledge creation is explicitly for the communities themselves and responding to their calls to, to amplify their voices. Um, that we see it as our responsibility, uh, that our work is almost directly uh, directed exclusively towards the communities, the human rights defenders, uh, and uh, responding to their requests, rather than, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, rather than the extraction of knowledge, but that it uh, uh, will be useful for all sorts of actions moving forward, which of course then we hope this book will, will be able to get this in Spanish as well as uh, this version in English. I think a Spanish version is gonna be super important uh, and promote community-based action that targets the demise of colonial, neo-colonial interference in all of our lives and our communities and to be witnesses and being a witness is more than listening and and observing but it's listening responding and so speaking out to stand up and speak out for what uh, with what we have seen and i would say this book has been our attempt to do that to to listen to witness to stand up and speak out and call on canadians to hold our government and companies accountable civilly, legally to work towards the creation of a legislative framework that would, would, um, would not only you know, allow it, but encourage it to make it so that we all don't only have you know, one case moving through the Ontario court system, and the one Tahoe resources case that moved through the BC courts. Unfortunately, this is uh, one, you know, a few cases of hundreds that should be moving through the courts. And so we need to work and listen to. And so we included the, the work of, of Corey Wanless and, and Marie Klippenstein, the Canadian lawyers working on the Hudbay Minerals cases in Ontario courts. And their call, they, they lay out very clearly some steps uh, that we can work towards to encourage uh, a legislative framework that would let us you know, hold these companies accountable and our governments for supporting, supporting them pretty much at all costs. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a lot here and so many people are on this call who know these stories well and uh, I think I'll end there and, and open hopefully we can uh, have some comments and, and conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, 
I don't know, Gabrielle, do you, are you opening it up for questions or should we just kind of slowly wrap it up or me? Uh, yeah, we had um, two minutes uh, for closing for each speaker. And then also if you wanted to do any last reflections before that. Okay, um, I'll just sort of say what I have to say. Maybe if any of the participants have something they'd like to jump in on to kind of close off the evening, we can do that. I just like to kind of pull together. It amazes me that we have four people telling very, very different stories, but the similarities are there and the themes this evening are so important. I just wish there was a book like this written for every country I've been in in Africa, <laughs> for example. Um, you know, what we heard tonight was amazing. We heard from Isabel that land is medicine and that earth heals. And then from there, we heard how she learned about death when the mind first came. I mean, that was just so incredibly powerful and telling. And Iseto talked to us about their struggles against that mine. Um, you know, how six people have actually fled the number of people who have lost their lives. And again, I was struck by the courage and the people who were willing to organize and their persistence, which is the only thing that people can do there without the help of people in Canada, um, changing something on this end. And then Sherry talked about the importance of testimonial and witnessing. And I think that's what this whole book is, I think that's a really, really important theme is the idea of witnessing. And as Catherine said, listening more than speaking, listening to the people who have the stories to tell and learning from them. And the other thing that struck me as Sh Sherry was speaking was the divide and conquer tactics, which are always used everywhere, all over the world by extractive industries. In, and because of the colonial and neo-colonial settings, they always work. In fact, I've, even see, I've seen them work really effectively here in in Mi'kmaq as well. Um, so what, what can Canadians do? I know that very often people are saying to me, uh, well, what can we do? What can we do? We want to do something. And I think as a rule, once Canadians are aware of problems, they do want to do something. And I feel that these two books and the voices that they bring us so poignantly and clearly, and the voices of the participants this evening, um, they do inspire action. And what action? Um, First action would be to keep listening and learning because um, I learned a lot tonight. And once you've learned, then you can find out what you can do to support the actions because they should be leading. They should be helping us learn and then also leading us and we follow. Um, Canadians are willy nilly um, tied to mining projects um, through their investments, both public and private. So I guess the message would be to anybody in Canada who has money to invest, uh, make sure it's not in any of these companies or any of these really um, egregious extractive industries that have been profiled tonight. And I think they can learn more also about supporting initiatives to make the Canadian extractive sector more accountable. I was writing recently about a Canadian company that's trying to extract Natural gas in Namibia, it's the same story there. And again, the core, the Canadian Ombudsman for Responsible Enterprise is, is not there when they need it to show that this company is, is causing huge damage to people and taking away their land. And then I also understand that there is a proposed new law. I'm learning this from you, um, which would be mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence legislation for Canadian companies working overseas and their supply chain. So I think all the organizations that have been involved in the, the supporting this event this evening, I think if people want to, they can go to their websites and find more about the Canadian Network on Corporate Accountability, which is a really great initiative. I was amazed to read um, in the, the, the chapter from Corey Wanless and Murray Klippenstein in Testimonio that it's really easy to take away the limited liability from these corporate labyrinths that they put together so that they get all the profits but have none of the accountability and responsibility. That, that I found really heartening that it actually is not such a complicated legal reform. And people in Canada, once are aware of these problems, just need to go to their elected officials and, and hound them and hound them and hound them until they take action. So I think we're in a, a very risky time. Um, Mining Watch Canada, in fact, today in London Mining, we're having their own 
meeting about the fact that we're moving into this period where there's going to be a real push for extractivism as if it's something wonderful and green. So I think these issues are more important than they've ever been. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that there are people like you out there bringing them to light and discussing them because I think that knowledge is where it all starts. And so anybody who I'd love to hear closing comments from any of the participants if they feel so inclined. Well, I would like to turn my time over to, to Isabel and Aniceto if they're still online from Guatemala and, and can and have anything final to share with us. Sí, gracias. Eh, Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias por, por escuchar, como ustedes dicen. Thank you so much for listening. Like you said, listening is so important. It's also important to keep in mind corruption. The theme of corruption is a very relevant subject in Guatemala, maybe also in Canada. But I wanted to mention that because extractive companies have a lot to do with the corruption in our country. For example, in Ellis store, when the communities were displaced by the Canadian mine, we saw that we saw that funds were being sent to the military and that organized crime were also receiving money to carry out that forced displacement. Our country has also been co-opted in terms of our judiciary, president of our country is also involved in repression. They stopped the resistance and the only thing that the communities wanted was a resolution on behalf of the courts in order to stop the operations of the mine. And they were fighting for their rights to a consultation. The repression has been a way of silencing the community. It's a way of saying that the consultation won't take place. They're doing a consultation with their own workers. The company created a group of people, of their employees, and made it seem as if they were community members that were being consulted. So this is a result of the repression. There's a state of terror in Ellen Store, so that people don't defend for their don't defend their rights. And lastly, I also wanted to mention that last week. Authorities entered into people's homes and then we realized that people's livestock started to die afterwards, their hens, chickens, etc. And we don't know what kind of poison the police left in each one of these houses. But it's a shame because they're not only killing with bullets, but they're also killing with hunger because they're killing their livestock. So once again, I just wanted to say thank you. And we hope that from where you are in Canada, that you can help us because it's countries that Canada that receive and reap the benefits of mining. We don't receive those benefits. It's only things that are extracted from here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Isabel. Aniceto, are you still there? Sí, sí, sí. Aquí estoy conectado. Lo único es de que tuve que buscar. Yes, I'm, I'm connected. Says Aniceto. I just had to leave my home. I'm in darkness because 
I'm I was trying to get some signal. I, I don't have a very strong signal where I live. So that's why I just had to change my location. I was coming back from the countryside and when I came home, I realized that I didn't have a strong signal. The only choice that we have left, I think, is that the Canadian community and activists and human rights defenders in Canada, I think there's a lot of advocacy work that you need to do with your government because I'm sure that a lot of the permits here in Guatemala, exploration and mining exploitation permits, most of them are financed with Canadian capital. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to Oh, he seems to have muted himself. I'm just going to let him know. There. So that the government can know that it's not helping. It's not helping the Guatemala people. I think that the investors should know a lot and should know a lot more. That they should be aware of the conflict that their investments are creating in Guatemala. We're under a lot of threat. Marlin, the Marlin mine stopped operating, but there are other permits, other permits that the government has awarded to companies and at any time new projects can start. So that's what I think we need to do. We need to do a lot of advocacy work with investors and with the government. And for us on our side, from the deepest, deepest part of our heart, we give thanks to all that have in, become involved in our struggle. We went through some very difficult and sad years and we were re-energized when we saw solidarity from all different sides. And that's something I don't forget and won't ever forget. And that's something our community will never forget because we've received so much solidarity, but we're facing a monster we're swimming against the current and we have to fight to continue going forward and once again thank you so much for the time thank you thank you catherine nolan as well with all the delegations from students who came who witnessed the disaster and a lot of them left with a lot more knowledge and understanding about what happened and that will help them advocate for our cause anyway i know we're short on time thank you so much i hope you all take care and i saw you solidarity greetings to our indigenous sisters and brothers in canada and i had a, a great fortune to visit some communities in canada a long time ago and i I'm so happy to know that we're in the struggle together, although I'm sad at the same time because I know as indigenous communities, we suffer due to capitalism. But anyway, I encourage you all and hope that you all feel motivated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aniceto. It's very powerful words. And as a, as a Canadian, I feel humbled and ashamed, I can honestly say, but I'm also really, really pleased um, to hear and to learn what I did this evening. And I think, this has been a remarkable event and thanks again to everybody who contributed to these amazing works and who's involved in this struggle. And with that, I uh, think we can say good night and there's lots to think about from here on. Thanks everyone. Good night, thank you. Thank you, Joan, for moderating and for everybody who organized and translated Paulina. Thank you very much.